So welcome everyone to uh, Home Recording 101. This class is targeted for SCA bards who might be completely new to the recording world. I'm Count William in the mundane world. I'm Pat Savelli. I've been working with music recordings since about 1990, back in the days of tape and analog. And I have nine albums to my credit. And I have seven of them with, uh, with Master Phil. You give yourself a quick intro. Hi, I'm Phil Reed in the society known as Master Philip. I have um, been involved with music for quite some time, but when I fell in with uh, Count William, we formed a non-SCA Irish band called Fintan, and, and we have done a number of albums there. And I'm also involved with Music of Subterranea, um, the medieval dance group that was originally mid-realm based and is now, people have scattered, but we still get together and record things occasionally. And I and uh, we released our that last album in just in time for uh, mid round fifty year, and I produced that whole thing from scratch, basically top to bottom. So I've got some hands on here in how to do that this sort of thing. And so as a introduction, just a, a little general kind of off the top, recording isn't scary. A million years ago, when I started in it, it required a lot of equipment. Uh, typically the only there really wasn't home recording outside of old style tape two tracks and you had to go to a studio and pay for those services and there's nothing wrong with that and we have as a band over the many years we frequently pay for engineering because it's sometimes good to let you just be the musician someone else do the work but with the advent of digital uh, recording has never been more available and easy to learn for the novice so Hopefully this class will give you a good primer. You can reach both Master Philip and myself on Facebook via email. If you go to the Middle Kingdom midrealm.org page and go to the roles of honor for either the chivalry or the order of the pelican, you can find us. We're really accessible. We pretty much live online. So if you have questions after this or you get into some stuff, we will be happy to assist. So with that, Phil, I'm gonna let you drive most of this. Uh, take it away. Okay. Um... Make sure everybody can see the uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint here. I can see it on my end. <clears throat> okay. I can see it. All right, here we go. All right, I want to record. Oh, here comes somebody just in time. Well, just in time. Who's T? T, I hope you can see the. Um, I hope I hope you can see the PowerPoint. Okay, just. Go All right. Here, so, okay. Yeah. Recording. <laughs> recording is scary and complicated and expensive. Well, it's not as nearly as expensive as it used to be. And it's complicated. It's as complicated as you want to make it. So I'm here to help. We're going to hit sit, sit here and tell you how you can do your own recording in your own house at your own pace and not cost an arm and a leg. We're going to get you set up to record in your own home with something that's reasonably versatile. It has reasonably decent sound, so you're not embarrassed to put it out. And it's as cheap as we know how to make it cheap. You will need to spend some money, but it's not going to be a whole lot. Okay, so what we're going to build here. Here's a picture. We're going to build, we're going to have one or two microphones or pickups. We're gonna connect it to your computer. The com we're gonna assume you've already got a reasonably decent computer. If you're not, you're probably not watching this. And you need a set of headphones so that you can hear it. Your PC may have speakers and it may have a microphone and you're gonna see here in a little bit why those won't help. But so this, these are the minimum pieces that you need to get started. So, we're going to start by talking about the stuff you need to go buy, and we're going to build a shopping list. And the first thing we need in a shopping list, on the shopping list, is a microphone, at least one. And you say, well, my PC's got a microphone, right? Or my headset here, I'm using a headset, it's got a microphone. Well, they're not 
audio quality microphones. They're they're cheap and they sound it. And if you were to just you put the two of them together, you're not going to get a quality sound out of a cheap PC microphone. Period. So here's the first thing we're going to have to spend some money. We're going to have to spend fifty to a hundred dollars or more. In some cases, you can spend it. If, how big a check you want to write, you can spend that much money on one microphone. But we're we uh, but we're not ready for that yet. So, but expect to spend fifty to a hundred dollars for a microphone. And let me there just are, say that these microphones that you invest in will last you your whole life. I have microphones that I bought in the '80s. These mics are now pushing forty years old. They're as good as the day I bought them. I took good care of them. I can I use them frequently. So when you think about spending $100 to buy a good microphone, think about the fact that you're going to have this microphone probably for your entire Bardic career. And $100 over 20, 30, 40 years is, is not a big expense. It's worth it to buy a good mic up front. Go ahead. Just want to make getting, sure we mention that. Yeah, I'm getting my props here. <laughs> okay, two types of microphones. One is called dynamic. Um, you see, you tend to see dynamic microphones used for live sound and because the, they're used in, a, in, a, in an environment where there's a lot of noise around the performer, they tend to be a little bit less sensitive and a little bit more directional. And they don't require anything except that they get plugged in. The other type is called condenser. It's higher fidelity, which may or may not make a difference. It's more tends to be more sensitive, so you need to work it a little bit more at making a quiet room, and it requires power. We'll talk about how you get that power here in a few minutes. The thing to remember, uh, I was going to say, you can stay on this slide. The thing to remember about condenser mics is you probably don't need one to start with. I didn't buy a good condenser until years into the process, and when we say that they are sensitive, we we have some mics that if you are standing there singing to the microphone like you see in the movies or you see at your RSD when you're, you're rubbing your, your, you're smoothing your pants, it will pick up the sound of you smoothing your pants. They're very sensitive. So I think for this exercise, dynamic is what everybody's going to want to start with. Get your feet wet and get used to using a microphone. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so a, a typical dynamic microphone, I have two of them here at hand. One of the Shure 57, SM57. I don't know if you can see it and me at the same time. I will, I'll stop the sharing, screen sharing here for a second. So here's, this is an SM57. The thing is, it's extremely tough. It's moderately sensitive. It's got a connector on the bottom we'll talk about here in a minute. It's a classic. It's been basically unchanged since, I don't know, the 1960s. It's, um, it, it, it's, a pretty decent little microphone. Here is a different one. This is a, a Sennheiser E835. We use this in my band. It's tailored more toward vocals, but it's it's a good all-around microphone. Okay, back to turn the screen share back on. Oh, wait, oh, wait a second. Here's a condenser microphone. This the one on the on the right is a Audio Technica 2020. Same connector on the bottom. You can't really see there, but I can see through the screen here, I can see the pickup. So they're not huge and they, you know, they're not particularly scary looking. All right, share, go back to here. All right. The nice thing while he's moving the share back, the nice thing about the Shure SM57 is it's nice for vocals. If you are doing vocal recording, it's a good mic. It also is very good at recording stringed instruments, say uh, guitars, lutes, ukuleles, violins. It's a very nice instrument for string, uh, nice microphone for strings. I own one. I think Phil owns six, <laughs> five. Yeah, it's a and these mics uh, sure built their reputation around ultimate durability, and the 57 and the 58 are standards of the industry. I, uh, so if you start with one of those. I, I started with one, and then as I was recording Subterranea, I discovered I needed multiples. And so I rented them once and decided that after that, it was going to be cheaper to buy buy them. And I bought them used, so I didn't pay full price. They're about 100 bucks full price. 
Okay, you're gonna need a cable. You're gonna want a mic stand too. It's much handier with a mic stand. And you're gonna, and I didn't put a picture of a mic stand. And you're gonna need a cable. You can see in the picture an XLR cable. That's just a term. Don't work. Don't let it scare you. It's got three pin connectors and there's a matching three pin connector in the bottom of the microphone and there's matching three pin connectors on the things we hook up. Uh, cables are not terribly expensive and they, if they're usually, if, they're, if something's going to break, they're going to be the first things to break, but that's good because they're not terribly expensive. So you're going to need a cable. Now, if you're, here's a picture of record, how you re might record a guitar. Um, we'll be talking more about that here in a little bit, but if you this is where you, an SM57 would work really well in this environment. That's, that particular picture is not an SM57, but it would drop in there in pretty much the same way. Recording instruments though is a real challenge, even um, for professionals. And there are many different ways to do it. Um, all of them work. They give you different sounds. It's up to you what you like. You can also put, if you, your guitar has a pickup, you can use it. I don't particularly like pickups for live record. For, they're great for live sound. I don't like them for recording that much because they tend to be kind of sterile. They're antiseptic. They don't have a lot of the characteristics of the music or the musician, especially like when you're sliding your fingers up and down the strings and you get the string noise. That to me makes a guitar sound come alive. And so I tend to want to mic a guitar like this more than, though I'll, I'll use the pickup too, but this, I prefer, I prefer this way. Okay. So you need a microphone, you need a mic stand, and you need a, and a you need a cable. And now you need an, an audio interface, something to take that connection and get it into your computer. Well, you say, well, my computer has that already. It's got a sound card built in. And a lot of them have sound cards built into them. I think they're pretty much standard these days on every motherboard. Well, there's a problem with that. If they're cheap and they sound cheap. Also, they don't have that XLR connection on it. Um, so you can, you're going to want something. And, and, and basically, you plug it in and you're at the mercy of the very few controls. There's very little that you can do with it when you plug it in. Oh, go away. So we're going to use something different. We're going to use something called, we're going to need a, an audio interface box. And this is the one I recommend, and I have one here. It's the same, the same thing. Um, there are multiples in this, in this price range. I happen to like this one. You can see that it's got, on the front, it's got, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, you can see it's got a place to plug in two XLRs. Notice that the hole in the center is a little bit bigger. That's so you can also plug in a quarter inch guitar cable. It's got some controls on it so that you can manage the volume. That's the power right there, that little where it says 48 V, that's 48 volts. That's the power for the condenser microphone so that you can, this will run a condenser microphone. This will take two inputs and run them to your PC over a USB connection. It'll, it's also a sound device, an output sound device, and it's got a place in the back to plug in a headphone, which you will also want. Um, some cases, you can get a microphone that's got the USB in it already, a good microphone that's got a USB connection already in it. You just plug it into the, the computer. That'll work. There's a lot of people that would do just that. Blue makes a number of them, and they work very well. I actually have one. You can use, there are ways of doing this without using a PC to record. Oh, I didn't grab my Zoom, it's upstairs. The, this, the one on the left this will record two tracks. You can, it's got, you can see it's got two microphones on it, so it records in stereo. It's also got a plug on the side that you can plug an external line input to, and it records to a flash drive, uh, a flash drive card, same as a digital camera. This one rec can record two tracks. This one can record eight. So the, these are the XLR inputs on the back. And you can record directly to a flash card so you don't have to drag your PC everywhere if you don't have one. Um, and let me, just, let me just add here, when we say the word track, what we mean is these devices will give you, each track is a single mono 
input signal, one voice, one instrument, one source. So the Zoom, which is what we use to record the band, we have two of them, allows us to record. So uh, the first five channels on that board we used for vocals, or six channels for vocals, each one microphone, one voice, and then instruments added thereafter. So when you're talking about recording yourself, if you just wanted to sing and make recordings, you only need one input, one track. If you wanted to accompany yourself playing an instrument and sing, now you need two tracks. Although you can do it one track at a time. And in go fact, back that's, and, a way, that's a fact we recommend it. We'll get into that. Yeah. But a track just means an input, one, one item, a vocal or an instrument. Okay. So, all right. So that's the next thing you need is some kind of interface to get the collect the audio data and get it to your PC. Next up, audio software. And this can range into a thousands of dollars if you want, but you don't have to. You can turn it turns your PC into what we refer generically refer to as an audio, digital audio workstation. Free to a thousand dollars. And guess what? We're going to do things where everything we're going to do here, we can do with free software. So you need to get the software, but, but it's free to download. It's free to install. It's free to use. It's free as you can do as much with it as you can, as you want. All right. There are several packages. I'm going to name them here. I'm not going to worry about them too much at this point. Uh, Personas, the people who make that little, in two track input box have has one called studio one prime um i use the one i use most of the time is cakewalk which used to be called sonar uh cubase is another one cubase le is the free version it this is a highly regarded thing in the marketplace there's one out there that a lot of home users like it's called it's shareware called reaper Audacity is free and open source and works way different than all the other ones do. I'm torn. I like Audacity. I don't use it much anymore. If you're I on will a say, I will just say, I use Audacity a lot. Um, Audacity is a, allows you to do some things that you can't do easily in other digital software. So a good example of something you can do in Audacity very easily is... I don't like the key this song is in. I can load an MP3 into Audacity and change the pitch of the song without changing the tempo. Olden days, you, you had tape speed, and so if you wanted to lower the pitch of something, you slowed it down and it started sounding like whoa, whoa, whoa. Audacity lets you change the pitch of recordings. You can also alter the tempo of a recording without changing the pitch of the recording. And we've actually used that. We, we recorded a song too fast, but the recording was really good and we didn't want to throw it away. So we stuck it in Audacity and slowed it down 10%, exported it back out and put it on one of our albums. And no one was the wiser. So I will, I, will, I have to say I've done exactly that in both of those in Cakewalk. I, it, I don't think, I didn't feel like it was nearly as easy in Cakewalk. Uh, well, I don't know about easy, but we had a dance piece that we recorded it, and then we sent it to the dance people, and they said, oh, that's nice, but it needs to be about 25% faster. Okay. Miracles right. of modern technology. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, so why are these free? Well, ignoring Reaper, which is shareware, it's free because they want to hook you into buying their commercial product. Um, most of the time, with the exception of Cakewalk, which is wide open, most of the time, for our purposes, the free version is good enough, even though it might be limited. Um, the Persona Studio One, the free version, will only record two inputs when you hit record. If you have more hooked up, it ignores them. Well, for our purposes, two inputs are great. Um, if you pay for the commercial product, which is like, I don't know, $400, um, it'll record as many inputs as you can afford to hook up. But for our purposes, two inputs is fine. 
because you can keep recording two inputs, two inputs, two inputs, and you can build it up as big as you want. Okay, so that's a, that's the software part. One more major piece that you're gonna wanna get are headphones. PC speakers are A, they don't sound good, they're not good enough, <coughs> and they, they don't give you iso sound isolation, so if you're recording again and you're playing out the PC speakers, you're gonna, you're gonna get feedback. You can, can't use earbuds, but they're not comfortable. I've spent hours and hours and hours under headphones. PC earbuds just don't, aren't gonna work. So that, I'll guarantee you that the headphone quality, sound quality is better. These are $30 or less. They sound excellent. They're very light. They're very comfortable. I have two or three pairs. I think Pat has five. Uh, yeah, so at least. Excellent, Leo. excellent headphones for $30. These things are really, really good. I have I have a lot of sets of these that I've put on all my machines for doing music. Okay, so that's com that completes the shopping list. Microphone, an audio interface, the free software, a few bits of accessories. Oh, I didn't mention the pop filter. Pop filter is designed to take it's transparent, acoustically transparent. You know, I'm going to kill the share for a second. It's acoustically transparent and clamps onto your microphone stand like so with this. And you sit this between your mouth and the microphone. And what it does is it filters out the popping sound because when the air puff from the popping sound hits your microphone, it sounds really bad. And these are, I mean, you could make your own as long. I mean, this could be, this is basically pantyhose material here. So you could make your own or you can buy one for like 10 bucks. For you burgeoning vocalists, you need a pop filter. It goes right up against the microphone and you sing almost right up on it when we will talk about that. But uh, I did some recording in the very early days without one and it just really quickly becomes apparent and for 10 bucks. And if you're inventive, you can jump on YouTube and see a hundred videos on how to make your own pop filters. They're very easy to make. And that is, I think, pretty much it. And so there you go, $250 and you're in. Okay, now, you need to set up a place to record. It needs to be, a, a, obviously it needs to be a quiet place without a lot of room noise. I mean, I am sitting here next to my PC. My PC is next to our laundry room and I can hear the dryer. If I can hear the dryer, then my microphone can hear the dryer and I don't want to have the, the microphone, I don't want to have the dryer in my recording. Hey, Drew. So, and I heard it just, even the studios aren't necessarily guaranteed to be free of this. I was transferring a tape for a friend. The tape was all she had, her studio recordings of hammer dulcimer music were lost. And all she had was a tape and, and tapes deteriorate. So I basically copied the tape into a computer and made a CD out of it for her. And I was listening very carefully to one piece and way in the background, I could hear a truck going. When we recorded, when we recorded, uh, our first record, when, when I made my very first recording in the studio in 1992, we were five miles from a train track and the train came through during the recording and we were in a studio with padded walls and everything and you could just faintly hear the train horn at the very back of the recording and we had recorded the whole song and we were done and we just left it in there but it's not something you want if you can avoid it go ahead All right so so you want to come up with a a, a space that doesn't have a lot of room noise Bedrooms are very popular for this purpose. As a matter of fact, I was watching the Grammys the slash that just went by. And wasn't I think one of the, the, the big winners was Billie Eilish. I think I got that name right. A lot of the stuff that she won Grammys for, she recorded in her bedroom. If you have a walk-in closet, that's like the ideal space or a decent-sized closet you could stick the microphone into and sing into 
those work well. We'll we're coming back. We'll come back to that. You need to. You also need to be aware of outside sound. Okay. And in subterranean, when we were recording in somebody's living room, we turn off the air conditioning in the refrigerator. And in some cases, we record at three o'clock in the morning so that you don't have a chance, so much of a chance of cars going by or kids play, noisy kids playing outside. You wouldn't be the first person to record at three o'clock in the morning. Or you can try and isolate the microphone. This is a sound baffle. The microphone mounts right in front of it. Um, if you don't feel like buying one, this one only costs 40 bucks. You can make one out of a milk crate lined with acoustic foam and put the microphone right in the middle of it. Or as William said, you can basically set the microphone up in front of your clothes and record into your closet. That will actually work surprisingly well. I know it sounds funny, but for all you skatians who have giant racks of clothes, you can actually stand your microphone up so you're singing into the coats, and it will really very effectively baffle the sound. Uh, and it's a and it's something that most of us have, are you know a closet full of garb, and you can uh, use that as a way to sing against to help you get a nice isolated sound. Recording instruments, that's a science unto itself. There are thousands of videos on how to record instruments. But they all start out with pointing your microphone at the sound source. Um, the details, oh God. We'll talk more about that as we go here, but really, um, every instrument is different. Every type of instrument is different in how you have to record it. Uh, sometimes the scenarios are pretty odd. You have might have a microphone coming in over your head if you're playing the fiddle. The microphone comes in down from above and points at the strings. Um, God help you if you're trying to record an accordion. <laughs> ask yeah, me how I know. You ask me how I know that. Quick and dirty rule for recording any stringed instrument is to have the mic about six inches to ten inches away from the twelfth fret of the instrument, or right between the twelfth fret and the sound hole. When you're recording your voice, it's if you're just recording voice, it's very, very much simpler. Okay, so I've, now we got that. Now we're ready to record, right? No. Well, we're going to hook it up. So you're gonna hook, you hook the microphone to the interface. You hook the interface to the PC. You get your software installed and ready to go. You tell the software, hey, I'm recording, which means it's going to create a track. Line shoots across the side and you tell it to connect that track to your sound device, hit record, right? And off we go. No, not yet. How much have you practiced your piece? Um, you need to be able to smoothly play through and consistently play through the piece without stopping and without major screw ups. Everything you, yeah. Sorry, everything you record is there for life. So you wanted this to be the best thing. I mean, people will forgive live a uh, little screw up in a live performance. You will not forgive yourself if you put, if you screw up on a recording and send it out with the screw up. You'll hear that flaw every time. So you need to make this as good as you can possibly make it, and that means practice, practice, practice. Yeah, I taught a class last week on performance prep, and studio prep is the same. Basically, when we went into the studio and we were paying, we were paying someone to be our recording engineer, which allowed us to just focus on being musicians. We would spend Monday night, two hours of practice, one hour, one song, one hour, another song. We would literally play a three-minute song 20 times in a row. Then Tuesday night, we would go to the studio, and it would take us five to six hours to get those two songs recorded. Wash, rinse, repeat until you had 10 or 15 songs done on an album. Our studio engineer used to joke because his studio time was very inexpensive. $25 an hour is what he charged us. You'd be lucky to find a professional studio that would charge you less than $50 to $75 an hour currently. Really, uh, you know, very, very unlikely to find much less than that. And the 
he said the studio, he says, my studio is a cheap place to record. It's an expensive place to practice. So when you're going to, even at home, when you're going to work on a recording, take a day to prep for it and then do it the next day or take a day to prep for it and give yourself a break and then hit it. Even songs that I have literally probably played 5,000 times, you get in front of the mic and you, you goof up. It's inexplicable, but do the prep work. You, I can't, we, we cannot emphasize enough that you will have recordings. We have recordings from the early days of the band that if they were to be, I don't know, wiped out in an EMP event, I don't know, we'd be really disappointed. <laughs> Yeah, you'll be surprised at what people give. You can get away with in a live record or in a live performance. You do not want that to get away. You don't can't. You don't want to do that during a recording. And it's okay to play with a metronome. Um, some people don't like it. They say it takes away it it it, it takes away their spontaneity. And if that's you, that's fine. But it is there's no problem with playing against a metronome. Uh, even when you're actually recording, we'll show you how to fix that and get rid of that here in a bit. But if you want to use a metronome, that's fine. You go right ahead. All right, here's the Reason, other thing. Let me, I, I want to just step back before you get rid of that thought. We were one of those groups that, that didn't really care that much. And I actually had somebody say to me when they had listened to one of our albums, they said, don't you record with a click track or a metronome or something? It's so obvious your guys' timing's all over the place. We, we, don't, we, we have a – when you're recording, you may or may not even be aware of it. And what I tell people to do is at least try it because it becomes glaringly obvious when your tempo is changing through a song that it should not be. So – our latest album that we did that we're really proud of, we, we click tracked everything and it sounds a lot better. Continue. All right. Here's the other thing. Tuning, tuning, tuning. Um, you need to tune every, at the drop of a hat, you need to tune. You tune before every take. You don't just start tuning, you tune, literally tune every time. Now my disadvantage here is that I play a drum. And if I, if drums tuning can change on its own simply by having the room, the, the, the drum, it's got a skin head, skin changes its tension based on how humid it is. And if it starts out at one note, it can wind up at another note. And if I need to go back and fix something in the middle, it's going to be different. I'm going to have to fight like heck to get the tune, get the, the, the tone to be exactly the same. So I have a pro I have problems. I basically have to roll through an entire piece and record it in one shot. But you know, if if you go back later and you say, "Okay, I'm going to play it again," and you let the t you didn't tune, and you have one note out of one string out of tune, <coughs> boy, you're going to hear it. So you tune every time. If and that means, if, go ahead. I was going to say, and as a vocalist on my prep class and on one of my other classes that I taught get a pitch pipe and figure out where you're singing the song. It's not to say you can't sing whatever you want, but F sharp and a half in a recording when you get to the production. And if you don't own a pitch, don't know what a pitch pipe is. It's a little disc thing about three and a half inches across. You can buy one. I have four or five of them. I have them everywhere and it's chromatic. It's simply you blow into it and it plays a note from the chromatic scale. The reason it's, it's, it's 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 like one it's like one hole on a harmonica. Yeah, basically, yeah, it's like a it, and the reason it's useful for for because in the band we do a cappella songs and you need to know where to start <coughs> and everybody needs to know where to start and you need to kind of train yourself so that you and as <coughs> you know you may be able to sing the song in the key of F on day but the next time you sing it, it your voice is tired and you want to sing it lower but if you train your ear like we train when we're working with a guitar or an instrument so to know when it's in tune and have a tuner it really helps the overall quality of of your recordings and 
as I've been listening to a lot of recordings from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and trying to learn some songs that we've, it's a little project my wife and I've been doing, you find half keyed songs and oddball things, instruments out of tune, and it's just so obvious. So even if it's just your voice you're trying to tune, a pitch pipe will help train you to hit that song the same every time, which is really what you're ultimately looking for. Okay, now we're ready to record. So you've done all the, you've practiced like crazy. You've got all the stuff together. Now it's time to sit down and actually do it. And what you're going to do first is you're going to record a pass through the song with everything that you need to do it a good, make a good pass. This is not going to be your finished product. You're going to record what we call a guide track. In the band, we call it a scratch track. The, you're going to record it, put the micro, you're basically going to set the microphone in front of you. You're going to set the metronome in front of you if you need it. And you're going to sit down and you're going to play it. In this case, you're going to play it like you were playing it live in front of an audience. And I'm assuming, we're going to assume here for the minute that you're basically, you're playing, you're a singer songwriter. You're singing and playing the guitar at the same time. Record, you go ahead and record the piece. You want it to be a good recording. If you gunch a note, you may or may not want to blow on through it and just keep going. If you if you if you screw up the timing, stop and start to do it again. You, you know, computer time is cheap. Computer space is cheap. Record it again, and once you get it good and you're happy with it as a reasonable recording, something to work from, you save it. Then you take a break. Now, you go back to your computer and you say all right i'm going to put the guide track into my earphones and you're going to put the microphone in front of you so that you can sing along with yourself because that's a, and this is where mic discipline comes into play dynamic microphones no kidding are designed to be sung into like this hang on a second okay they're designed to be sung into like this. You'll notice that my lips are right on top of it. And in when I'm doing this live, my lips are brushing it. This, this picks up the best. Condenser microphones, you can, you can stay back from. And remember the pop filter? Pop filter, microphone, me, about like so. And also, sing standing up. You uh, gen you generate more vocal power when you're standing up. Back to the screen. Go. Yeah, and I was just gonna when you, especially for new vocalists, you see people holding mics like this, or where the mic is like a flashlight, and the only place that can hear your voice is the beam. And the beam is exactly as big as the end of the microphone, if you want to show it again, Phil, just if you've got it handy. And think of that thing as a flashlight, and you have to be in the beam, and you have to be, when I'm singing live, the microphone is against my lips. When I'm recording, we put a pop filter between us and the microphone, but we're still probably no further than a couple of inches distant, because the the thing about dynamic mics that makes them nice is that that sound, they don't pick up junk sound. Anything behind the mic is gone. But also, here, you got to be right in the line of the microphone. And so many people. See, it'll, it'll pick up about like yay. Yep. And that means if you're holding it like this and singing across the top, it will sound up nothing. terrible. It'll sound terrible if it picks up anything at all. And this is like, a, it's just a, and practice with it. Just hook up your mic system, put it on the stand and sing in it and move around. And we call that mic discipline. One of the reasons a lot of people like head, uh, headphone microphones, and I see that Drew has a question, but let me finish this thought. One of the reasons that uh, a lot of pro singers like headphone microphones is they can set that perfect and it's good for the whole recording which is really nice. Then you don't have to worry about your mic discipline. For those of us who are playing guitars and things and may or may not have that option, it's a little tougher, but uh, go ahead, Drew. 
Um, it's not necessarily so much of a question as it is a just a, a comment. Um, I have a Yeti, uh, a, a blue Yeti microphone, and it's uh, this is what it looks like, right? And you'd think that I should sing into it like like this, but you don't. You sing into it like this. Yep. That's where the thing is. So it's just a know where your pickups are in the mic. Every microphone has a special play. It, it, it is they call it microphone addressing. How do you talk to the microphone? On my uh, this is on my AT twenty twenty here. You talk in here. You it this this is open for other reasons, you know, acoustic design reasons. But yeah, the, in this one you talk in here. Um, different microphones are different way, different settings. The manual. They call it a manual, usually one page. It comes with a microphone, tells you where the, where the sound pickup is. Yeah, you need to be aware of that, and you need to not wander very far away from it. Okay. Back to that, and pop filter if you need it. Think standing up because you generate more vocal power. That's why you have in high school choir, you might have practiced sitting down, but you always perform standing up. Like discipline we were talking about. Recording levels. This is where we start to get technical. Your recording software will have a little meter on it of some kind. It'll be bouncing back and forth as you talk. You want that to be high, but not crashing into the top. Um, if it crashes into the top, you get digital distortion. It sounds really, really ugly and cannot be fixed. We can always boost lower volumes. We can't fix it if it's too loud. So you'll want to perform at your performing level. This usually works better if you have two people because somebody can sit there and watch the meter and tell you if you're singing too loud. And if you are, don't stop singing too loud. Use the knobs on the front of the control to reduce the vo input volume, the volume going in. All right. It helps here to have your headphones on because you're going to be listening to the guide track and you're going to be singing along the guide track. That's why we have the guide track there so that you have the melody in, in front of you. You're basing sing, basically singing along with yourself. But this time you've got no chance of picking up the guitar on the vocal track you've got the vocal track is just nice clean sound of you play you singing no metronome if you use the metronome you're not using the metronome here because you've got the metronome recorded it's in your ears now so you're gonna record the microphone listen to the guide track make sure that your levels are good and not too high and away you go Metronome, you'll hear the metronome so you can stay caught up with it, but you will it will not appear in the final product, which is what you're shooting for. Start over if you screw up. When you get when you get all the way through it and you're happy with it, and it's, of course you can always stop and listen to it and and decide if you like it or not, then save it and remember that's going into the final product. So you want that to be as good as you can make it. Now, we're going to do exactly the same thing, only this time we're going to record your instrument by itself. So you need to set up the microphone this time. Remember that picture pointing at the mic. If you're doing a guitar, you can point your microphone more or less at the 12th fret, about halfway down the fingerboard if that's what you're recording. If you've got some other instrument, you may have to experiment a little bit. Bear in mind, you're not going to be able to move. If you have, if you play and you have a lot of body English when you're playing, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to sit there and hold a really steady in front of the, the microphone. Make sure that there's enough room between the microphone and you so that you don't like smack it with your fingers. But that's what you're, you're going to sit there and, and play into the microphone. You're, if you're used to using guitar effect, guitar effects, you don't want them here. <coughs> It's much easier to add them later than it is to try and take them out if you decide you don't like it. And now you, you set up there like before. You listen to the, the guide track in your headset. 
and then you record the instrument. Press, check your levels, hit record, play along, do not sing, just play. And you and that's it. You have now recorded the piece. If you want to get fancy, you can record another guitar track. Or you could record, okay, suppose that this is a two piece. So you've got a guitar track and a penny whistle track. You can go keep doing this as, as, long, as much as you want. You're just gonna keep adding one track at a time and keep layering them on top of yourself. And I'll typically wind up with, I don't know, 20 or 25 tracks by the time I'm done, depending on what I'm doing. Okay. Here's, you can, you can, if you want, and if you've got the inputs, record multiple tracks for, for the instrument. And this especially applies if you have a pickup. Because you can put a microphone in front of it and record in track one, and you can plug the pickup into track two. And then you can mix them together later. That can give you a better sound. Um, William will show you, can show you videos where people will wander around the instrument while somebody's playing and somebody else is pointing a microphone or something. One guy's playing, the other guy's pointing a microphone at the instrument, trying to find a good place for it, where it sounds the best. And then he'll position that in a microphone stand and do it again with another microphone. If you're using multiple microphones, the only thing that you want to do is make sure that they're both the same distance away. It's technical, but the microphones need to be the same distance from the instrument. And the reason for that is, and it would be the same thing for vocals, you typically want to record one at a time. If for some reason you wanted to record two vocals, you as the singer need to be the exact same distance from both microphones. Otherwise, the minute difference in the time it takes the sound to hit the microphone will end up in your recording, and it, it is very, very, very hard to fix. In it's fact, usually at that point, you just chuck it. It's very, it's very obvious, and it sounds really weird. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you're really good at playing along with yourself, there's no reason you can't record them out, just do two, two multiple tracks of the recording and then blend them together. Now, this is important. You want to keep, if you're, especially as you add, get more than two tracks, you're gonna to wanna to keep track of what each, each track is. I'm using the word track twice. So you, you basically have a, you write down a list. Okay, track one, guide track. Track two, vocal, take one. Track three, blah, 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 whatever it is. That way it'll help later when you go back and try and figure out. And, and also you can do th write down things like track three, 35 seconds in. plucked a note wrong on the guitar. You need to fix that. It helps you keep track of what you're doing and and what piece is happening on what's happening on your recording. So I still have I still have the track books from the first uh, time I ever went in the studio. Eight track tape and it's exactly that. Who's the performer? If if it's just you, you don't have to write who the performer is, but it's really nice especially if you start layering your vocals. That is to say, uh, we, we have a friend and back in the 80s, I helped her build a demo and she recorded four part harmony one track at a time. So she came and sang the melody and then she sang the first harmony track and the second harmony track and the third harmony track. And if you don't write down what's on all these tracks, you can quickly, you know, and you may wanna record first, you know, one third up harmony, first try, second try. You know, you can record multiple times and then pick what you like, but using track sheets makes your life better and much easier. Okay, once you finally get all the tracks you want recorded, then you save your project, you make a backup of your project, and then you take a break. And I am not kidding. Once we finished with um, the main recording for the the latest Fintan album, my break was a week. I just needed to get away from it for a little while, so I stopped. I stopped hearing it in my head. I think it's pretty subterranean. Was pretty much the same way. I spent at least a week before I went back to it. You just need to 
yeah, you just need to stop remembering it because you're going to start next the next part and you're going to spend a lot of time doing this is editing and mixing. Editing is where you take the bad bits out if you've got any and you can rearrange the good bits. And this is a lot like word processing. The software gives you the ability to hack out chunks if you want to or copy and paste and do the, all those fun, fancy things. So this is where you, this is what you're going to wind up doing. Now, if you're doing, suppose you're just doing a, vo a spoken word thing. You're rolling along and you're, and, and you're reading it into the microphone and it's okay to have the, uh, the script there in front of you and your microphone's right here and you're reading it along, but you screw it up. Well, in this case, you just say, all right, back up a couple of sentences and read it again because you know that when you get it to the editing phase, you hit that spot, you can just chop it out and nobody will know. On recorded music, it's tougher. It's not, it's certainly not impossible. And I do it all the time. If you like, okay, I had one person was playing the violin, they're playing along, microphones up here, bonk, they hit the microphone. All right, well, that would be, ordinarily you'd say that would be a script. Of course, you listen to the piece and say, well, the, the mic, the the violin's not playing anything important on that point. I can, I could hack that bonk out and nobody will know. And in fact, that's what I did. This is typically the term for what we're talking about here. It used to be called punch in, punch out because you would be, you could turn the recording head on a tape machine on and off. So if I flubbed a word, you would back the tape up to just before where the flub was and literally the song would be playing and I would hear it and the engineer would be sitting there with his finger over the record button and he would turn the record head on like I'm singing along and he would turn the record head on long enough for me to get the word right and let off and uh, it's much easier with digital. But I will say for the, for the starting engineer, probably just re-recording it unless it's something really long like if you were wanted to record a, a passage you were recording a story so five six seven eight minutes you might consider recording it in chunks and then assembling it later so that you didn't have to try and make your marathon way through you know not everybody can record in a gata de vita on one take that's kind of you know, so you may find it just simpler to record in pieces. For a three-minute song, it's it's infinitely preferable to just go all the way through it and get it right. And then do your effects and your minor edits and things like that. Trying to clean up more than one or two very small mistakes in any recording edit is just too much work for when you're starting out. It's just too hard. This is why you recorded with no effects. Um, because if you're editing, and let's suppose that you have to hack out a note, but you've got reverb that you recorded, that reverb tail is in there for seconds after the note in some cases, and it's impossible to clean it up. Not at all possible. So right. here- this is the term here we're talking about is this is why, and, and it will sound terrible to your ears. It's called dry. It's your voice, the microphone signal to the computer, and nothing else. Because as Phil pointed out, if you use some fancy vocal tool, that is stuck with the recording where you could easily add that later. So we talk about recording everything dry, and dry recordings are a little hard to listen to, but that's where you can tell if the sound is good and know what you have to do. Okay. Once you've got it edited and that's sort of an, this is sort of an ongoing overlapping process. Now you start what we call mixing and that is where you blend the tracks together and it make it sound like it's all one piece. You're Yeah. Not just, this is also something that you learn over time. 
and there are many, many books on it, but we're not going to get into those. You're going to start since you're, you're going with minimal, um, minimal instrumentation here and minimal, it, hopefully maybe even only two tracks. You're going to start small and work your way up, but you're still going to have to balance the sound so that it sounds, you don't have some parts that are too loud and some parts that are too quiet or you know, or you can't hear this, the vocalist because the guitar is overwhelming it. There are a multiple multitude of tools that you will apply here. And we're just going to talk about them real quick because that's, um, we go back to this years long, years of college experience to get or, or in the studio experience to learn everything about them. Equalization is where it's, it's a equalization is volume based on frequency. What you may discover, for example, is that the microphone you're using is a little, it, it sounds dull. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily sound the way you like it to sound. And that may be because the higher frequencies are, it doesn't pick them up as well. So you use the equalization to raise the volume of the higher frequencies. Compression is the difference between where it reduces the difference between the loud parts and the quiet parts. Um, you might use this, for example, if you say you wandered back from the microphone a little bit. You, if you leaned back from the microphone, the microphone didn't pick you up as well. And you get in close to the microphone and it picked you up really well and you started to sound kind of boomy. Well, you can use compression to lower the loud parts so that they're closer to the quiet parts. There are a lot of, lot of other things that you can do with compression that I, I barely can touch what they do. Um, there, and there are a number of real interesting tricks that you can use, but that's a tool that's out there. Um, leveling, we talked about, a lot of these software packages will allow you to do automatic leveling. You can draw a curve that says, for this stretch, be at this volume and then come up. And where you might use that is suppose that you've got, you hit the end of a verse or you hit the end of a chorus and there's a little bit of few note break. You might say, raise the volume of the instrument during that break so that it doesn't feel in the recording like the whole thing disappeared because you stopped singing. You are at one level of intensity sound intensity with the guitar plus your vocal and then you stop because you hit the end of the chorus and you're getting set for to start the next verse and the sound level just goes and disappears so maybe you raise you, you can automatically raise the volume of the guitar and then drop it back down when you start singing again and now is when you put in the effects back in reverb is really common um for bards, I don't suppose that you do a whole lot in terms of guitar distortion, um, but this is where you would put it in if you did. There are software plugins that you can install that will do if, give you the same effect as a guitar pedal, whatever your guitar pedal is. There's out the software that will do it, and this is where you would apply that so that you don't end accidentally, or you didn't want to record it, but you wanted that sound. This is where you would do it. And let me would... just jump in here for a sec. So why is effects important? You say, well, I'm going to record my voice and my voice is good enough. So when you look at recorded music throughout any genre, so uh, for instance, I listen, I'm in an Irish band. I listen to a lot of Irish music. I even listen to a lot of bands in our space that are like us, semi-professional. Nobody records dry. At a minimum, a little reverb creates a richness in the sound that you want for vocals. Doesn't necessarily take a lot. The other effect that's used a, a bit is called delay. If you want to study these, you can jump on YouTube and, and probably go down a rabbit hole that'll take a few hours of your life. But at a minimum, some equalization and some compression and maybe some reverb will make your voice sound more like what you are used to hearing on recordings. It'll take some of the stark edges off It'll make everything even, so it doesn't sound like you know you're moving back and forth in your recording, and 
if you listen to music much, you will notice that most professionally recorded music, and there are quite a few professional SCA musicians or SCA adjacent musicians who record and sell their music, is it's affected. It's not dry. They've put some stuff in to rich up the sound and help with that feeling of what a professional recording sounds like. So while it's, it may seem like a lot, these few things that you can use, just these couple of things make an enormous difference and do it, you know, you can listen to it dry, add some effects and listen to it. You know, most of these uh, digital audio software tools let you turn off all the effects. So you can hear it dry and then put your effects on it and listen to it. And I think without exception, you would find that it is much better with a small amount of affecting. Because the other thing is, if you record someplace that's dead, that doesn't give you any reverb, like you're, you're in a, a closet, but in the real world, we got sound bouncing off everything. So there's a natural amount of um, energy that comes from that in our voices that we're used to hearing. And dry, it'll sound very stark. So you want to do this stuff. Back to you. Okay. If you want to do, let's suppose that you've got a choral group and you want to do Gregorian chants. Well, you got two choices, one of which is to find yourself a cathedral and record in the cathedral with all of that great room sound and the fact that the reverb in that, the natural reverb in that room takes three seconds to die away. And also the, when the cop car drove past with the sirens on, that, that sound takes three seconds to die away. Or you can record in a in a controlled environment and put the reverb in later. Um, if you're working at that level, give me a call. I've got some ideas on how to do that. And yeah, it might require require recording at three o'clock in the morning. So it goes. But by doing as all point, of I was just gonna say, as pointed out, if the only time your environment is quiet is three in the morning, we guarantee you will not be the first person that ever recorded their stuff at three in the morning. In fact, I've recorded at three in the morning. Yep. It's very quiet. <laughs> it's very quiet. One of the studios recorded at actually had his uh, furnace set up so he could shut everything off while we were recording. Now, once you play around with your mics and things, you'll get a good idea of what, what background noise is acceptable and what's not, what you can hear and what you can't. Here's where you might use various effects. Like I said, I don't, for SCA purposes, we're unlikely to, I mean, you're going to record straight guitar. You're not going to record distortion, guitar distortion. I wouldn't uh, think so. No, and, and, I'm, and I'd be a little, com depending on what you're doing, I don't know if echo, how much you'd want to use delay. Delay is like echo. Um, reverb, though, is very important pretty much everywhere. Now, panning is where you position items in the sound field. If you're listening to stereo on headphones, some instruments are more on this side, some instruments are more on that side. Um, occasionally, you'll hear comedy albums or something where something will just march across the stereo field from one ear to the other. That's called panning. Um, when I do subterranea or when I do fintan, I will say, all right, I'm going to put the vocalist is going to be lead vocal is going to be dead center the guitar is going to be a little bit over here the fiddle is going to be a little bit over there um this creates a feeling of space you don't want everything in the dead center now as it happens if you're playing off a boom box or something like that with this where it's got stereo speakers but they're close together and you're far away from it you're not going to hear that stereo separation, but you're going to hear it in your headphones. You're going to hear it. If you're wearing earbuds, you're going to hear it there. You're going to hear it in your car. You're going to hear it. If you're playing on a, on a traditional home stereo with speakers set up at a distance in front of you. So doing the panning is important. It's a little tough to achieve. If you're just doing a singer songwriter thing where you're, you're singing and you're accompanying yourself on a single instrument, this is another case where doing recording the same instrument with two different tracks. It might be useful because you could do the pickup over here and the microphone over here and give yourself a sense of space. 
you think about that and that may be something you discover going, you record it and you don't like it. And then you go back and I'm going to record it again, only this time because of the issues like this, you're going to record it with multiple microphones. Yeah. The listening to each track over and over. I don't remember how much time I put in. Uh, I didn't track how much time I put in on the Fintana album. I put in hundreds, hundreds of hours on the, on the, um, on the sub latest subterranean album and it didn't help that we had a hard deadline but you listen to the track by itself you make the adjustments you if you need equalization you go ahead and build, put the equalization in those sorts of things then you start listening to all the tracks and you say wow that guitar is really loud here i need to back that down or more of what happens more often is the guitar, the frequencies of the guitar are occupying the same frequencies as your voice and they're mixing, they're messing each other up. So maybe you go back and you not go into the equalization and you take some of the guitar out of a certain frequency range to make acoustic space for the voice. But you're going to keep listening to it over and over and over and your ears are going to get tired. So you put the microphone, you put the earphones down and you walk away until tomorrow and then you come back and you keep doing it. You keep plugging away at it. You're adjusting the lever, the levels, you're adjusting the tools. It now, will... it's probably fair to say, though, if you're just recording vocals and maybe you're only recording one or two tracks, maybe a harmony and a melody, you probably don't have this kind of time. You're not going to tie up that kind of time. Our band has 15 inputs in a lot of songs, and it takes a lot more mixing work. But if you wanted to record something like a song, maybe something like in a round where you had a song that you wanted to record, and so it's going to have a melody and maybe one or two harmony voices, your process of mixing gets much more complex and time-consuming. When we recorded the album before the one we released in 2018, I spent... I took vacation, a week of vacation, and I spent Saturday to the week following Sunday, 10 hours a day, working on helping the engineer mix. And we, you, if you listen to yourself on a recording for too long, we usually use the term, your ears just get burned. You can't hear the mistakes anymore. You just can't hear anything. And so with one voice, if you're just trying to record single vocal, it's not going to be too complex. But every time you add something to recording, you're you're increasing the complexity because now you have two things contending. And was my, you know, you're trying, you sing a melody and you want to sing a harmony. Is that harmony at the same volume level or do you want it at the same volume level? Or as you start working through those things, those are things to think about, which is why we said back at the front, practicing and being consistent with your mic discipline, singing at the same volume in a place where the sound is the same. I, uh, I did a quick record of Scarborough Fair with the canical as done by Simon and Garfunkel to use as a practice piece. And it has a guitar part and it has two vocal parts, pretty simple. Still took me about three hours to put it together because I had trouble getting the voices in a place where it sounded nice. So keep that in mind. It's gonna take you some time to learn how to do mixing. And Don't even, sweat it. Yeah, and it's going to take time to mix the piece. That's just, just need to know that going in and expect it. So patience and back up your stuff. Nothing worse than putting hours after and hours and hours and work on it and then losing it to a hard drive crash. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And it's worth mentioning. You should be, anytime you make a change that you like, that you want to keep, you can save your file incrementally. Some of the softwares will help you do that. Every time you save, it'll automatically increment. If it doesn't, come up with a system so that you can keep track of your file names. But back up early, back up often, and then duplicate your work to a second drive. Uh, nothing, nothing is more soul crushing than losing what are called your original masters to a computer failure. And it's uh, back them up, burn them to a CD, put them away, stash them have a spare hard drive, something hard drive spaces become cheap, stick them on a thumb drive, but have a backup of your working production stuff b before your export, you know, cause eventually you're going to export out to a format that can be put on a compact disc or a digital format, like an MP3 or an AVI that you're going to listen to. 
but at the end of the day, you want all that front work where your tracks and your all the settings and everything are, you want that file. And in most of these systems, it's a directory with the name of your song with a whole bunch of files inside of it. You want that saved. We were actually, I was going to say, we were actually able to take some songs we had recorded several years ago and reuse them for the new album and remix them because we had all the original files and Phil threw them into the, the digital audio workstation and was able to bring them up to our modern sound standard that we used for the new album. And it was really nice, but we had all that work. I did that actually with the subterranean too. We had stuff that we recorded 10 years ago that we still had copies of. I was able to bring it in and edit it up. So, and then when you're done, yeah, like he says, you're going to export it to something like an MP3 and pass it around. Um, that's a whole different exercise. But how do you know when you're finished? Well, maybe when you say to yourself, God, I can't look at this anymore. <laughs> Here's a, here is a quote that I found from, how do you pronounce that? Valyari, he's a French poet in 1933. And he wrote that, which in English is, it's never completed, you just abandon it. As somebody who writes songs, I would agree. Um, one of my favorite artists is a gentleman named Andreas Volenweider. He produces amazing harp music, and it's not like what you think it is. He writes all this incredible stuff, but he's legendary. His producers want to shoot this guy because he's forever tinkering with his songs. And I have uh, most of his record. I think I have almost everything he ever recorded. And the same song appears across five albums. And if you didn't know that it was the same song, you wouldn't be able to tell because he'd so radically tinkered with it each go through. Yeah, I mean, there are multiple pieces that I, if I went back to the subterranean stuff or if I went back to the Fintan stuff and listened to it again, I said, oh God, I need to, ch I need to change that. Or oh God, I need to fix that. You could sit there and screw with it forever. And at some point you just have to stop. There, in, this in, is why, and this is why you, and why there are music producers in the business. Music producer's job is to say it's done enough. The engineer would work on it until the end of time. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but so for yourself, you have to learn to listen to it and say it's done enough and I'm going to drive a stake in the ground because more than a few people I know who write and record music never got anything done or over so We've had the band since 2002 when we've produced seven albums. The first six albums had 15 songs each, and the newest album had, what did we put on Excursion, 12 or 13, 12? I forget. 12. So you're talking about well over 100 songs, and we – that's that's pretty good you know so basically we recorded an album about every other year every other year and a, every two years or so um i know bands that have been around for 20 years and have one album because they just can't get through the recording process oh you know we've got most of it done it's mostly fin okay there there have a friend who loves you and who it will be honest with you and who can listen to your stuff and in and say hey this is great and it's good enough Believe me, most people listening to music cannot pick out the mistakes. They can't. Uh, and it, there are artists that shoot for perfection. I forget, you know, the legendary story of the recording of the song Good Vibrations by Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. And this one song took like 10 months or a year in the studio because it's so complex and they, the, the record company indulged him because, well, it's the Beach Boys and they were selling gazillions of records. But in practicality, but, you know, he made a song that people still listen to today, in, in, 40 in, years in, later. In the, in the world of manufacturing, there's a, a, a saying. I mean, we're talking about you know, manufacture of anything, manufacture car, manufacture, you know, Q-tips, whatever it is. There's a saying. And, some, and the saying is that sometimes you just have to shoot the engineers and start production, you know, because they'll just design it into the ground. Oh, I can make this just a, a hair better and if I tweak this and you'll never stop. So sometimes you just have to, you just, okay, I'm done. 
you walk away from it, you ship it. Teachers, We're, it's a skill you have to teach yourself. We always joke in uh, in some of the work that I do. We say so to get the first ninety percent of the work done, you spend ninety percent of the budget, and to get the next ten percent done, you spend ninety percent of the, the budget. The next ninety percent of the, the budget. Next, yeah. You just so record a song, get a song done, and and. When you're learning, you could sing something like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, anything, some song that you like, just to get yourself a, a project to go through the process. Okay. I've hit the end. <coughs> Questions from the, the people who are still with us? <laughs> Perfect is the enemy of the good. That's the truth. You just have to decide what your good level is when you're when you're making recordings for yourself. But I I really do suggest folks record something really simple. Record a nursery rhyme. Record some song you know inside and out, and walk yourself through the process of going from I've recorded it. Now I'm going to mix it, and now I'm going to say it's done. And here's my MP3 that I could give to some of my friends to say, Hey, here's my here's my first effort. What do we got here? What else is in the chat? Yeah. Is there any questions? We covered a lot of stuff, but it's still, we're just in the basics. If you have questions, we will be happy to answer them. We left plenty of time here. And, and hey, you're, you are. to hear more about your personal opinions on Audacity versus Cakewalk. Audacity versus Cakewalk? <sighs> mm-hmm. Well, while you're thinking of your answer, I, mine is easy. I like Audacity for quick and dirty, but it does not compare to using Cakewalk. Cakewalk is a professional product. I've been using Cakewalk since it came out in 1980, I want to say six or seven. And we have produced almost all of our work with Cakewalk. It's an excellent product and it's a professional product. Audacity is great for quick and dirty yeah. recording. I use it all the time. I've only used Cakewalk for scoring. I've never used it as a recording piece. Oh, it's a, it's a full-on recording tool. My problem with Audacity is that, okay, and, and granted, okay, I haven't used it and looked at it closely in a couple of years, but let's suppose that I've recorded a track, all right? I've got a track here, and I say, I want to do equalization on that track. So I pull up the equal, I select the section I want to do equalization on, which might be the whole th track. And then I apply the equalization and bang, it's applied to the entire thing and the control panel goes away and that's it. And now, I, okay, now, so now I go in and say, all right, now I want to do, I want to put some reverb in. So I put the reverb in and now bang, that, and that, that's applied to the track. But now the reverb has made the equalization bad. I can't go back to the equalization now because it's been applied to the track. It's been applied to the audio data and the original, and the original audio data is gone. It overwrites your original. Yeah. It, it's the, uh, the data, the data is recorded in. Okay. Here goes. Pat's going to Unless, jump in. unless you make a change, save it. Then you make another change and save it, and you just version yourself. But, but I used even, Audacity. I used Audacity two days ago. I use it a lot for stuff that I'm doing with my wife, where we need to take a song and rekey it. We need to take uh, a song and slow it down, or such for our our things. In terms of simple recording, it's okay. But I have a full on license. But Phil and I both own full licenses to Band Labs. Cake, uh, Cakewalk was originally its own product. And then it got uh, it got bought by Gibson, Gibson. Gibson, and Gibson promptly killed it, as Gibson does with everything. And then a company uh, that had a very uh, a simple but nice tool online, the company's called Band Lab, bought it, and now it's Cakewalk by Band Lab, and it's the same product that I've been using since 1987. With all the feature updates, we really like it. And if you're gonna do anything serious, you need real software. Cakewalk, or Audacity is nice to get your feet wet with some of these ideas of how recording works. It's completely free. 
But when you want to actually do, I mean, if you do scoring, yeah, if you want, you need a real tool, right? You can't just. Yeah. yeah so, to, to, to go back to that business about, all right, you suppose you, you, you apply your equalization, you save it. Now you apply your reverb, you save it. Now you decide that the reverb screwed up the equalization, so you go back to the, re the equalization, but the reverb is gone because you backed up two versions and it's yep. no longer you there. Yep. Then you have to apply the reverb again. Whereas in most modern digital audio software packages, you insert an effect in an effects in a line of effects. And you say, all right, so the original audio data comes in the top and it's gonna pass this through this effect, then it's gonna pass through the reverb, and oops, it screwed it up. So I go back up here and I tweak the, the equalization without screwing around with the reverb. That's the traditional way you do it. In, and that's the only way, really. I mean, yeah. what, would, what would you have to do? What would you say if you, if you pulled up a, a, word, a word document and you selected a, a line of text and you made it bold, but then the command of do bold just disappeared and all you had left was go, was bold text, right? It would become unusable. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so yeah, um, I, I have, Pat uses audacity. I use it occasionally now, but if I'm doing anything serious, it's going into a cakewalk or it's going into persona studio one where I've got the, it's set up like a, an actual honest to God studio where here's an effect and it's an individual module and I can take it out or alter it without screwing with the original source material. Okay. Yep. So, yep. Did that answer your question, Rebecca? Yeah, it did. It did. I, I have a step foot in a studio in years. So. Uh. <laughs> the nice thing is, and, and, and studios still have a place for sure. We really liked it. We had a studio engineer uh, that we had formed a strong relationship with and we could go to his place at a very comfortable studio. So our bass player, Ryan and myself, we have dedicated studio spaces in our homes now. And it's nice, you know, you can do those things and have some of that stuff, but having somebody who's doing the pushing the levers and the knobs while you're trying to be the performer, is nice we we self we completely 100 percent self-produced our last band album it's called excursion the band's name is fintan you can find it on on itunes if you want to hear it all of our albums are on itunes and i wish some of them weren't but you can see the genesis of our first album in 2004 to 16 to uh, 14 years later in 2018 as the technology and our skill as musicians and our understanding of production grew and our excursion album, which we put out in December of 2018, which Phil engineered and Phil and I jointly produced, we recorded uh, seven of the tracks in the studio in our bass player, Ryan's beautiful new studio. And we recorded five of the tracks live at the pub. I have an Irish pub in my basement that I built and we invited 20, 25 of our close friends and fans over, and we created a, a live recording uh, in a controlled yeah. environment. So it has crowd sound and everything, but it's not like you were trying to do it at a bar where there's some junk in the back screaming about football or something. And the difference, the journey. <laughs> Freebird, man. Linnea has all, Linnea has all our, uh, all our CDs. Anyways. So yeah. Um, but for the sing, but, but, even for just doing a single vocal, I wouldn't consider really – Audacity will give you some feel for the software, but getting something like Cakewalk or Presona Studio One, they're both pretty easy to use. Plus, there's huge communities of people out there and tons, and I mean literally thousands of YouTube videos. If you're like, I don't understand how to use reverb in Cakewalk, go to YouTube and search using reverb in Cakewalk. <laughs> How did we do anything before YouTube? I uh, the hard way. <laughs> well, and t it, part of it too was indicative when I first did my when I did my first studio recording in 1990. First time I ever went into a studio was 1991. Eight track tape. No, there's no effects. There's no effects at all. I'd say there there was some overriding effects you could use. 
but basically it was you and the soundboard and equalization and maybe you had one effect like reverb available in a per channel but that's it and depending on what was on the board you might have some panning right right and we did we recorded uh i we've never put it out to any place we sold a ton of them locally and uh, if people want them i will generally so then, but we created a recording project and we were recording we uh, we produced cassettes back in 1992 with a project of all SCA musicians were doing all original work so we didn't have to fiddle with copyrights. And yeah. we produced this album all on our own, but we had a studio engineer and then we used a, a production house to do, we did all the work, but the gentleman taught us how to make cassette tapes and do post-production, all that good stuff. Now you've got every guitar effect, every vocal effect, you know, you can turn your voice into Kanye West, even if you're not a guy, even if you're not a guy. And you can, you can, some of that is good. <laughs> some of it is not used for good purposes, I think, in a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate you gentlemen taking the time this afternoon to go through all this. It's been a good refresher for me. And the uh, uh, much more detailed handout than the PowerPoint is available on the SCA Bardic Arts in the file section, which is like, I forget how many pages this thing is. Uh, Phil put most of it together and then we edited it. It's, uh, it's, 18, it's 18 pages and it, it covers everything we talked about and uh, pictures and links. It's got links to all the software and pricing lists, all kinds of stuff. So I you might find that, it. yeah, you might find that useful. And if you're not a, on SCA Bardic Arts, you can join it easily enough. It's a real nice group. There's a lot of good stuff out there. I've been in the SCA so long, I retired from Bardic Arts years ago. <laughs> we might know what you're talking about. We've both been in a long time. <laughs> and just so you'll know the reach, I'm in Onsteora. Oh, nice. One of my Bardic buddies lives out there in Richardson, Texas, Master Lewis Blackmore. He's part of, uh, we, we have a cross group kingdom spread out all over the place, little music group called Bardic Storm. Really yes. the only time we are able to play is probably at is like big events like Penzik where we're all there, but we, uh, we work on music together for the SCA. And that's a that was how the band started. We started the band to do music in the SCA, but it wasn't really a venue for what we wanted to do. So we moved out into the real world. And 18 years later, two tours to Ireland, one to Scotland, seven albums. I quit counting performances when we passed 500 paid performances. I don't even know how many. So. Enough to keep food on the table. No. No. <laughs> Enough to be a nice Christmas bonus. That's it's, a, what okay. it, it, it's a hobby that pays for itself. More or less. Fairly. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. How, so much. yeah how, do you, how, do you, how do you make a small fortune in the music business? Start with a large one. Start with a large one. Ah, yeah. she's all over it. Yep. Okay. We're done. I can even Any tell you the definition of a gentleman someone who knows how to play a sham and doesn't. Ah. <laughs> So. You know, say you hear the story about the accordion player who left the accordion in the back seat of his car and forgot yeah. to lock it up, came back, found two accordions. <laughs> yeah, we can do this all day. Yes, we could. Thank Does anybody you, else have a question they'd like to uh, ask before we uh, shut this off? All quiet. Well, you can find the handout in the file section of SCA Bardic Arts, and you can find us online. We live in the ether. If you have questions, please. We're always, I always say on all the classes I've taught, uh, I've made lots of mistakes. You don't need to make my mistakes. Go make new mistakes and then tell me about them so I don't make them. But you certainly do not have to drag yourself across the mistakes that we've made as, uh, in 18 years of being in a band. You don't have to make those mistakes. You will, though. It's the nature of the business. <laughs>